Uh, my name is Manoj. Uh, uh, I'm the chief architect at CodeOps. Uh, this is be uh, this will be a quick uh, world world session on uh, a topic that I'm pretty excited about, which is uh, managed Kubernetes services. Um, so basically, uh, uh, the world I come from um, is is where you're not necessarily starting your journey uh, cloud native, right? So you've probably come from a world of uh, monolithic applications, traditional two-tier, two three-tier architectures. Uh, you probably have a lot of uh, uh, old-style uh, design patterns in play, right? So you're not necessarily uh, coming into the world with uh, a microservices approach. You already have stuff, right? Uh, but that said, uh, you would probably, uh, you know, uh, uh, would have uh, been pressured to believe that, uh, you know, to drive agility in your particular line of business or product, you would need to start thinking about DevOps, right? And, uh, and, and microservices, right? So you need, you're coming from the world, the monolithic style world, uh, traditional line of business applications, NTR2, DevOps. So uh, the natural pathway to that would essentially be containers. And, uh, and more or less, uh, when we talk about, uh, you know, we, uh, containers and DevOps, the natural bridge between them is uh, Kubernetes, right? So you need orchestration, you need auto-scaling that uh, Rishi talked about, right? Um, so that's the, uh, so people uh, now have started to believe that uh, containers are the way to go. Uh, you got to start thinking about, you know, uh, going to a microservices architecture, right? Uh, and uh, and essentially think about DevOps, which talks about all the, I mean, to think about, you know, uh, uh, intelligent uh, monitoring, metrics, and everything that Rishi talked about, right? Auto scaling, how do you think about that? How do you have your own custom metric, resource metrics, and so forth? So you, you're, you, you now start to think about those as well. But the challenge now is, like the world I come from as well, and it's my own experience that we, uh, when we think about containers and Kubernetes, uh, it's a pretty much uh, Kubernetes when you uh, think about it or start using it, uh, it it's actually uh, pretty, uh, it's a pretty tough thing to, uh, to set up, right? Especially, uh, you know, uh, when you really have to talk about uh, all the aspects of running a cluster, uh, you know, maybe stateful uh, applications uh, which have databases or NoSQL, uh, so it's 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 been a substantial challenge even for me for example right um, the world of minikube might be easy but when you really have to deploy it onto a uh, uh, you know a private cloud or a public cloud like azure or aws there are significant challenges right um, so do you guys agree anybody has been from that world just one okay so uh, which is where uh, you know i uh, was really excited when uh, late last year onwards, I think almost every cloud provider uh, uh, started to give an offering uh, which uh, was essentially called a managed Kubernetes service, right? So uh, essentially what it, uh, so uh, I'll be talking about uh, Azure, uh, uh, the Azure Kubernetes, managed Kubernetes services, AKS, but essentially you can, uh, you know, every cloud provider has, including IBM, including uh, Google, uh, uh, AWS, they have their own managed services, uh, 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 you know, uh, engines, right? So what exactly is a managed services, uh, uh, managed Kubernetes engine? So so basically the idea is that the, the goal of uh, a, a, a service like AKS is simple, right? So uh, you have to have, uh, you know, a, a native Kubernetes experience, right? You need, because uh, it, it offers a lot of uh, agility and a lot of, uh, you know, uh, capabilities that helps help, help you do DevOps, right? At the same time, uh, you're kind of uh, taken away from the headaches of setting up Kubernetes with KubeADM, you know, uh, thinking about, uh, you know, uh, how do I take XCD backups? How do I manage state? How do I actually deploy it across multiple, uh, you know, uh, AZs? Or how do I ensure that uh, you know, the control plane itself is actually not a single point of failure. You know, these headaches are taken care for you. The control plane is completely managed, right? Um, and everything is uh, is simply taken care for you, right? So that's the beautiful thing, which means that you are basically, uh, you know, uh, allowed to do what you do best, which is designing your microservices 
especially if you're coming from the world I talked about, which is lifting and shifting. If you're kind of logically lifting and shifting your, uh, you know, applications, containerize them and move to Kubernetes without getting into the uh, nitty gritties of actually setting up a Kubernetes cluster, right? Uh, that's one, but there's more, right? So uh, that's, and in actually when I saw it first, it was kind of re, uh, it was almost unbelievable. So the, the actual service, which is the management of the control plane, the control, control plane itself is actually free, right? Uh, I think Google, uh, Azure was the first to actually give, offer it for free. I think Google closely followed. Um, I'm not sure about the state of AWS yet, but I believe, uh, you know, it's a small charge. But, uh, uh, you know, the way things are going, it might actually very well be free, which is pretty awesome, right? So you have complete management uh, uh, done for you. You don't have to worry about all the nitty gritties of setup. At the same time, it's actually free. So what else is the benefit? So the other thing is uh, that when you deploy a Kubernetes cluster, uh, all the uh, 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 best practices of setting, it, setting up a cluster is, is, is kind of uh, built into the template. When you, for example, when you deploy it on Azure, you automatically get a scale set, you automatically, uh, automatically get a, good, uh, a load balancer, routing tables, a public IP, everything beautifully wired in, in a best practice way, right? So you don't have to worry about those nitty gritties yourself, right? Like for example, uh, a, a typical virtual, uh, you know, virtual network or a VPC in a AWS, uh, you, you, the way you set up your uh, cluster is kind of built in into the template. And uh, uh, the other benefit is that uh, there is seamless integration with all your native services uh, that comes from the cloud provider. Like for example, uh, a class, the most important and most uh, commonly uh, used uh, in, in a, in a multi-node uh, cluster is, is load balancing, right? The application load balancer or a network load balancer, right? So that's uh, the primitive for load balancer that you set up in your deployment manifest automatically translates to a load balancer in, in Azure, for example, right? Uh, so that's, those, those things are built in. Like for example, a managed disk uh, or an EBS volume in, in, in AWS, right? A managed disk in Azure is kind of built in, right? So you don't have to worry about, uh, uh, you know, those connections. Secret management is kind of built in, right? It in integrates with uh, your native uh, uh, key management and so forth, right? Um, and the uh, other benefit that you get is that it is a, it is a managed service, so there is an as SLA associated with it, right? Uh, that's another thing. So you don't have to worry about the control plane uh, uh, availability as such. Um, it, it's it's kind of managed. I believe for Azure, it's it's 99.5, right? Uh, uh, so is that right? Okay. Um, initially, I thought it's 99.95 that there was some confusion, but uh, uh, but it's th there is uh, an SLA. It, it is uh, a, an SLA backed service, although it's free, right? Um, the uh, and the last, but probably uh, 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 the most important thing to think about is uh, a native upstream Kubernetes experience. So when when a managed service uh, is provided to you, it's it's actually Kubernetes in its native form. So it is, uh, you get the entire experience of kubectl or kubectl, whichever way you want to pronounce it. So it is that native experience. There is no custom uh, forked version of Kubernetes or there's no custom, uh, you know, implementation that is very uh, uh, proprietary or, you know, it's, it's nothing, it is essentially native Kubernetes period, right? It, with, with upstream portability. So you can upgrade uh, or choose a specific version, uh, you know, starting I think 1.6 all the way to 1.10, 10.x uh, 10 and so forth, but you would get that native experience. So all these are essentially the, uh, uh, the key benefits that you get from a managed Kubernetes uh, provider. So, so far you're with me? So, the, in other words, it's pretty exciting. I mean, if you think about it, I'm not a, uh, to be honest, I'm not a Kubernetes black belt as, as Rishi and, and Atul maybe, but the point is I don't need to be. Uh, I just have to focus on core microservices uh, architecture for my application, worry about the aspects of cluster management and, and the master, uh, the control plane uh, availability, backups, et cetera. I just leave it out to Azure and, 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 and I just worry about how I develop and deploy my microservices with it on an agent pool that's given to me, right? So that's the that's the benefit. And I, I was pretty excited. I think it was, uh, I think late last year, uh, these services were announced at the time of build, uh, reinvent. And I think uh, almost all cloud providers have this available as 
in general availability. They're all GA, right? Uh, so you can actually uh, uh, use it uh, for production. Uh, that's that's pretty uh, pretty good. And every uh, almost every uh, benefit that you get from uh, add-ons, from extensions, uh, from uh, you know from uh, from projects in the Kubernetes ex uh, you know ecosystem like Prometheus. Uh, like Helm or Draft or whatever have you, uh, you can still leverage them, uh, you know, pretty uh, pretty seamlessly, right? There's nothing uh, that uh, puts you away from it just because it's a managed engine. So these are uh, essentially some of the uh, uh, biggest uh, benefits, and I, it's, it's very compelling, right? So uh, let me um, quickly dive into, uh, that's pretty much the uh, slide part I had. Uh, it's probably we'll spend a little time to look at how uh, the experience of uh, AKSS, which is the Azure Kubernetes uh, service, right, or the managed Kubernetes, Kubernetes are offering from Azure, right? So, so let me switch here. So uh, this is my, uh, the Azure portal. So I'll, I'll quickly uh, talk about what the experience is like. Now typically if you want to do or try this yourself, uh, an end-to-end, -end, uh, a simple, say Python Node.js application deployed, uh, multi-container application to be deployed on uh, something like an AKS takes around 30 minutes, yeah? Uh, one second, let me. Yeah, so it's probably my resolution. Yeah. Um, so typically it takes, uh, you know, 20 minutes or 30 minutes, so we don't have so much time here. So I'll, I'll walk you through the experience quickly, uh, maybe not going through all the steps. In fact, I've pre-deployed a cluster. It's the same sample that you can uh, get from, uh, uh, you know, get from Azure. Uh, Azure samples or tutorial. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a simple Python application that has two containers. Uh, the, you can call it the front end and the back end. The back end is a Redis, uh, and the front end is basically a simple Python running on Flask. Uh, that's the solution that I already have, and the front end can be scaled. Like the HPA, uh, you can uh, use H Node Auto Scaler. Uh, I'm sorry, the uh, Pod Auto Scaler. Uh, you can actually use uh, Node Auto Scaling as well, and that's the uh, unit of scale, the the front end, right? Uh, uh, so that's the sample. It's a very simple application. So I'll, I'll actually uh, have deployed it already, but I'll tell you what the experience is like. It takes 10 to maybe 10 minutes to set up the cluster, but uh, we don't have so much time to do it from scratch. But if you were to start off uh, with Azure, uh, you would start off choosing a Kubernetes service uh, from your, uh, um, uh, from the templates available. So essentially, uh, it, there's a, it's pretty simple. Uh, in Azure, at least, uh, the, num the steps that you have uh, is very straightforward. All you need to do is uh, select a cluster name, uh, select the region. At the moment, I believe not all regions might have Kubernetes service, but, but just watch out for uh, you know, an MSD, and you'll probably uh, know the uh, pipeline for uh, this being available in the region of your choice. Uh, you select a Kubernetes version. Uh, these are the options available, uh, pretty much. Uh, running all the way to 1.10.6. Uh, a DNS prefix, which is again uh, something that you can choose based on your uh, workload. Uh, the node size, which is basically the, the instance uh, type for your agent pool VMs. Uh, you can choose uh, from several options. So uh, uh, a whole host of options, again, uh, based on the workload type, you can select a memory intensive, storage optimized, GPU intensive, and so forth. I believe at the moment, uh, uh, Atul, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, you can create only one agent pool, right? Uh, uh, but I believe in the future, uh, you would uh, have uh, uh, an ability to create multiple pools, like uh, Rishi mentioned, a GPU intensive pool, a compute optimized pool, a memory intensive pool for different types of workloads that you manage. But I think right to, at the moment you have, you can create uh, any number of, uh, I'm sorry, you can create one agent pool with any number of nodes, and this is the instance type uh, or the node size, right? Uh, you select the number of instances, and uh, and you're good to go. You can actually just create it right away. Uh, there's some uh, uh, customizations you can do on the authentication side, uh, like, for example, uh, you're, uh, you know, defining your service principle, whether you want RBAC uh, enabled, 
Uh, service principle is a way is basically uh, uh, think of it as uh, uh, you know uh, uh, the principle or account with which the Kubernetes cluster runs, and that needs certain permissions to work in your Azure uh, infrastructure. Like for example, if it has to access uh, a container registry, if it has to uh, access the storage and so forth, the uh, permissions are assigned to this principle, right? Uh, networking, again, uh, you can define uh, whether you want basic or advanced uh, networking uh, configurations. Um, again, monitor. If you enable uh, monitoring by default, you're hooked into uh, the, uh, you know, log analytics, uh, basically uh, uh, the, uh, the Azure built-in offering. Uh, you can actually, uh, it automatically ties into OMS and, uh, you know, log analytics workspaces. It, it, in fact, creates a new workspace for you. Uh, but if you don't want to use uh, log analytics, you're free to use uh, any logging uh, or analytics tools like Prometheus or uh, uh, and so forth, right? And uh, that's about it. When you hit create, it it, it starts to provision uh, uh, multiple uh, resource groups, and I'll show you how this would look like. Uh, I'll not create it right now because it takes around 10 minutes to do, but uh, here's how it would actually look, right? Um, Um, if I were to so I'll just expand it a little bit. So what it does is it it creates a, um, um, a resource group which houses the Kubernetes service itself uh, based on the name of the cluster that I created. So in this case, I created a cluster name called BCC. Uh, it, uh, by default, would have uh, the Kubernetes service. This is the Kubernetes services uh, that was created. I also happen to create a, a container registry. This does not get created by itself. You have to do it. But I've just put it in the same uh, resource group. Uh, for those who don't know what a resource group is, it's, it's basically a way to logically organize your, uh, you know, your, your services or instances, right? Uh, it's, a unit, it's based on, uh, it's basically a way to also uh, put governance around access control and cost, uh, you know, for your Azure subscription, right? Uh, related resources would, would come under a resource group, right? Uh, AK, uh, AKS also creates uh, uh, another resource group uh, called MC underscore cluster name underscore, uh, uh, underscore uh, 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 I mean, uh, the, uh, the prefix, the DNS prefix underscore the region. So this is some, this is, uh, the resource group where actually your um, entire agent pool, which is essentially a set of resources, uh, compute networking storage uh, for your cluster that you uh, have control, uh, basically, right, is, is all here. Essentially, this is where your, uh, <coughs> your nodes, uh, where your pods are deployed would, would be. And if you see, uh, like I mentioned, one of the advantages of using a managed Kubernetes uh, engine is that uh, an entire virtual network with you know, the uh, best practices around uh, scale sets, like scale sets are something like an ASG in AWS, right? Uh, the routing tables, uh, you know, the uh, uh, security groups, uh, the load balancer, uh, the storage accounts, the managed disks, everything is automatically created, wired up and given to you, right? Uh, nothing of these is something I, I created, right? You probably wouldn't need to even go here. Yeah, and from here on, you control your cluster through uh, command line, right? Either through kubectl or uh, AZ AKS command line. So I'll show you that in a bit, right? So this is the uh, second um, uh, uh, resource group it creates. It also creates one for uh, uh, for your uh, log analytics workspace, uh, the OMS workspace, which uh, uh, if you choose to, you know, use uh, OMS, that that's where it is. But essentially, the important one, uh, important thing to know is. Your actual service lies here, and your agent pool uh, lies here. So all your virtual networking stuff is is all here, right? And in MC underscore, so that's the kind of convention that you currently have, right? So that's how the uh, portal experience is like. But essentially, uh, portal experience, I would say, is kind of uh, typically, like in a Kubernetes world, limited. So most of what you want to do is is done from the command line. So uh, so what are the options you have, right? So, um, so like I said, um, um, 
the advantage of using a managed Kubernetes uh, service is completely native uh, Kubernetes experience. So essentially, uh, you have kubectl with you or kubectl, whichever way you like to pronounce it. Uh, that is, so if I were to do a uh, kubectl get pods, you essentially uh, would, uh, you know, uh, get the say access to the same uh, cluster there, right? So uh, I'm just hoping my internet is good. Okay. So similarly, uh, you know, uh, if you were to essentially, uh, you know, uh, where to uh, do HPA or anything, uh, you know, nothing, uh, no holds barred there. So you have that complete experience with you. So like I'll quickly show what uh, are the, uh, uh, what's the command line experience uh, typically like if you were to do one, if, if you want to set up and manage the cluster yourself using the command line. Um, I don't know how, how clear is this from the back? Is this clear? Okay. So the command line experience of, uh, of setting up a managed Kubernetes cluster is something like this. I'll quickly go through it. Again, I don't have time to run through this because it takes around 10, 15 minutes. Uh, not, not more than that, right? I mean, as a newbie a few months ago, I just was able to do all this in like 10, 15 minutes, right? Um, in fact, uh, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll come to the DevOps project later, but so how do you go about it? Once you log in, uh, select the subscription that you want to uh, deploy to. Uh, you can just do AZ AKS create. Uh, AZ is the Azure command line and AKS is the, uh, the, uh, the provider, uh, right? Uh, uh, the resource provider. So you just create a, uh, the cluster this way uh, using AK, AK, AZ AKS create. Um, once this is created, you can actually set the con uh, context of your command line to use, uh, you know, to connect to that cluster using AZ AKS get credentials. So the, the local context is set. Um, so, and then to, uh, to browse the particular cluster, uh, all you need to do is AK, AZ AKS browse. There's something like, it's like a short form of kubectl uh, itself. Like for example, the, uh, um, the, the cluster that I have set up is a very simple one. It's like I said, a simple Python Flask front end and a Redis back end. So let me try to browse that um, cluster quickly. So so this basically is the local, it, it tunnels into the actual uh, Kubernetes cluster running on Azure. So this is how it looks like. Um, and, and this is no different from your Kubernetes experience, right? So, um, so I have uh, basically uh, two deployments, one for the front end, one for the back end. Um, I have three pods, basically two pods for the front end, or one for the back end. Um, there are multiple replica sets here, but uh, that's because I actually deployed multiple versions. I, I'll show you that uh, demo in just a bit. Um, and uh, that's about it, right? So all I had to do was once this cluster was created, kubectl apply and that's about it. It was done, right? So going back to the uh, uh, experience here, right? Um, you create the cluster. Uh, you can connect to uh, you can connect to the cluster uh, through the through, through the local tunnel uh, local tunnel using uh, AKS browse. Uh, I chose to do uh, an ACR. Uh, Azure has a native container registry called ACR. Azure Container Registry. I, I actually created one. Um, uh, and then uh, from there on, once the container registry was created, um, I uh, actually had to go and uh, just uh, start using it. So I could actually do a Docker push. There is one small step that you need to keep in mind, uh, which is not probably important for this. Uh, um, uh, I mean, we don't have time to go through it. Is once uh, the container registry is a separate service, Kubernetes is a separate service. Uh, you will have to have the the Kubernetes service principle get access, read access to the container registry. So there is a sep, uh, set of command lines for it. Um, um, so that's the uh, one step that you need to do. But once that is done, all you need to do is uh, build your application. So um, do a Docker, Docker compose build, um, tag it with uh, whatever version. Um, so I'm using uh, the name of the uh, the registry here is BCC demo. So the actual uh, 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 endpoint is bccdemo.azurecr.io. And uh, 
this is uh, this is my tag, which is I've kind of kind of uh, called it v4 here. So push it to uh, uh, the container registry, and uh, then uh, basically do a kubectl apply. Write this command line 30 here, and that's about it. That's how I deployed the sample application. Same native Kubernetes experience. Nothing changes, right? And um, what you see here is uh, essentially that. One small step to just, uh, the, so that's a tricky part. So some, it's very easy to miss uh, giving permissions to the uh, Kubernetes uh, service principle uh, to access the container registry. But uh, once that's done, it's, it's all pretty straightforward from there. So let's quickly, we have like uh, five minutes. So let me try to do one thing just to uh, show something in, in uh, uh, something. So let's try to do one thing. Uh, we'll update the application and see what the experience is like, right? So. Um, uh, so the actual application I actually didn't show how that looks. It's something like this. Um, it's a it's a very simple app. This is the canonical container app. I think it came from, you know, container con, uh, Docker con from 2014, right? So the same voting app. Uh, I can actually vote for either Docker or Rocket in this particular case. Uh, and uh, this is actually persistent uh, persisted in Redis. So it doesn't have a persistent volume, but but you get the idea. You get the multi container. Uh, multi-containers, uh, uh, that's a two-tier uh, application experience here, right? So this is the application, very straightforward. Uh, I can just vote and the vote results are stored in Redis. So that's, that's pretty much what it is. So let's try to push an update to this particular application. So let's, let's probably create uh, maybe, uh, let's call it cats and dogs. Just maybe change it to, uh, okay. Okay, typo there, sorry. Okay, so so this the application has been updated, so now what do you do? What's the next step? It's not a trick question. So I build locally and deploy locally, test locally, right? So what do I do? Oh, sorry. So I um, build this locally. And uh, let me test this uh, locally here. So it should probably reflect and probably show cats and dogs. So you're all good to go. So it's, it's all working. So let's push this uh, back to uh, the container registry first and then uh, update the deployment to take the latest tag from the container registry. So, so next step is uh, let's push this uh, and uh, we'll call it v6. It's a good practice to set a version rather than putting latest, which is probably not recommended, right? Um, so I'm just hoping that the internet is, I uh, forgot to tag first, sorry. That is just local. So let me uh, create a tag, I just missed that part. So let's create a local tag first and then uh, push this, right? So hopefully that'll be quick because these layers already exist in uh, the Kubernetes cluster. So I'm hoping this will not be uh, delayed, okay. So, I think the credentials expired. Let's, let's try pushing this. So, so far you with me while uh, this will just this will be quick, uh, hopefully. Okay.
but uh, uh, while we wait for this, uh, any quick questions? Yeah, I think, see, uh, to be honest, like I, meant, uh, like I started off this presentation with, a uh, lot of folks that we speak to, in fact, uh, you know, uh, a lot of projects I've done uh, are not necessarily cloud natives to start with. They're not net new development, right? And people find it difficult to start using Kubernetes uh, uh, from the get-go. So for people to jumpstart their, their you know, uh, uh, their journey into the world of microservices and Kubernetes, this is awesome. Uh, that said, there is, uh, there, there is still a non, uh, I would say unmanaged version, so ACR is still there. I think you can still do uh, uh, a fully unmanaged or you completely manage, uh, something that's completely managed by you can still do that. Uh, you can actually, in fact, not use Kubernetes. You can use, uh, you know, DCOS or any orchestrator you want, Swarm or whatever. So those options are still available. I think uh, Azure supports multiple orchestrators, so does every cloud provider. So unless uh, you want a specific, uh, uh, you have a specific need not to use the, you know, the, the managed uh, offering, like for example, you're using a version of Kubernetes that's not supported by a managed, uh, by AKS, for example, or you're using an orchestrator that you want to have complete control over, or, you know, some fork that is specific to your product or business. In those, unless there is some need like that, uh, I think you're good to, uh, I think it's, from, at least for the kind of use cases I work with, which is traditional line of business, enterprise, uh, you know, uh, workloads, uh, you know, this should uh, pretty much suffice, right? Yep. Sorry, uh, he's, let him complete, I'll just come to him, yes. No, so uh, the the answer typically is what is where are your investments primarily? Uh, you know, uh, you know. For example, if you already have a significant, uh, um, uh, you know, investment in Azure. For example, you already have uh, you're using Azure for several other workloads, several other services. You already have uh, an account hierarchy in place. Uh, you you already are. You already maybe, uh, for example, have a direct, uh, you know, express route set up. You know, you might have be, you might be invested in Azure. So you, AKS is the natural choice. But that said, if your business is completely invested in AWS or you have a lot of uh, resources, you have like, for example, your backend already in, a, in AWS. Uh, it's, it's, I think there's complete parity in terms of the offerings, right? The, there's very little difference. I don't, I'm not, uh, I don't think that it's it's right to say one managed service is better, probably better than the other. There are some minute differences, which I think uh, you know these things are evolving at a pretty fast pace. So uh, it's it's only a matter of choice for the business. Like for example, I know a lot of uh, you know retailers would choose Azure uh, because of non-compete with AWS. Like for example, right? It's a completely uh, uh, you know left to the business. I don't think a feature difference will create, will really result in a choice. That's that's my take. So it's 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 very similar. It's where the, the, there's there's good amount of parity. Yep. 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 So. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, so you're talking about um, uh, network, right? So when you use uh, Kubernetes uh, in your AWS platform, what kind of network CNI you will use here? The standard open source CNI is like a Telecore. Panel, or uh, you have built your own CNI for networking purpose. So, what do you mean by select a network? You mean the uh, for the for the? Uh, uh, I mean, you're talking about the express route uh, setup. Uh, I didn't follow so the question. Talking about Kubernetes, right? Kubernetes uses CNI to communicate. Oh, the, okay, okay, sorry, that right. okay. Mm -hmm. Internal port to port or not to uh, port to node or no, not to node, right? Mm -hmm. So it uses standard open source CNIs like a panel or Calico, right? Mm -hmm. So, so, so how do you how do you use same in your uh, AWS platform? How do you use the same? See, uh, so are you going to uh, you have your own CNI or you are using Panel or Calico uh, in your? No, no. See, platform? the experience here is that of a regular, uh, uh, you know, uh, Kubernetes networking, right? So nothing changes. The only the primitives used, like for example, uh, the uh, you know the the load balancers, the uh, the routing, etc., are leverage the underlying Azure or AWS uh, counterparts. There's it, there's nothing that's new here. It's it's essentially the same Kubernetes, say 1.10.1, leveraging uh, you know uh, 
the underlying uh, you know uh, azure resources or aws resources or what have you there's nothing that that changes here you still uh, you know like for example get the pipe, uh, public ip assigned to you uh, that that the same way uh, it it maps to the public ip uh, service that that azure provides it uh, you know it uses the same load balancer application load balancer when you when uh, when for example uh, your your uh, service uh, chooses for you know when you say uh, the service spec chooses load balancer it maps to the azure load balancer and so forth this is not networking this is mm -hmm. not networking this is uh, you are talking about load balancer for ingress north south or mm -hmm. east west so i'm uh, i was asking networking so you are deploying some like a kubernetes which is like um, orchestration and when it deploys, it brings up application in terms of ports, right? Correct. Now, ports to port communication, they use uh, third party open source applications like Calico, Fanel. So, if I use that Calico same, so uh, how do you implement that? that we, we are not aware. That's why I'm asking are you using same Calico or Fanel or you built your own networking framework where the IP will be assigned from your IP pool, uh, IPAM pool uh, to okay. the uh, uh, port? So, right? you have a, com so uh, I probably. Uh, uh, don't know to the extent of uh, you know having custom networking for the best of my, uh, my knowledge you don't have control over it when you use a managed offering uh, that's what I can say but uh, probably I will take it offline uh, maybe I'll check with Atul as well uh, so I'm really running out of time yeah, sure. so just one last thing uh, so what I did was the deployed a new version so I've already set the uh, the ACR image uh, to use the latest version all I need to do is uh, uh, go to the uh, the endpoint that was uh, designated to me, which is which happens to be this 40 point. I don't know if you can see it, but uh, I changed it from uh, Docker rocket to cats and dogs, and here it is, right? So it's pretty much uh, so it created a replica set that's using this version, which is version six of the 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 front end, right? So and I just uh, all I had to do is kubectl uh, set deployment and set image, and that's that was the experience that uh, that happened. So it got. Uh, a, any new requests so the so we didn't do a kubectl get pods but what happened was the old uh, pods were terminated and the new pods with version 6 was deployed right uh, th that replicas that that version 5 still exists so if i have to go back to that i can always go and say set image version 5 and you can still go back to it right so uh, i'm completely out of time for questions we'll probably uh, you know defer it uh, to our later uh, so thanks so much guys so a little lower time, so questions will probably take it offline, right? Thanks, guys.